So I'm going to be talking today about web traffic. Um, I've been writing uh, about, web tra about web traffic for about six years now. Um, web traffic is, plays an important role in my new book. Uh, it's played an important role in other things and other research that I've done. Um, but I have to be honest. For the past six years, every time I've sat down to write something about web traffic, I've had this nagging sense that there was something big that we had been missing. And particularly, I felt like we have not understood very well the dynamics of web traffic, how websites grow and change over time, how they add audience, how they lose audience. Um, and so a couple of months ago, I received a present from Bill Tanser. Uh, who is the Vice President of Research uh, at Hitwise, which is a large internet tracking firm I know that some of you are familiar with. And Bill sent me daily data for the top 300 sites on the internet and the top 300 sites in a couple other categories. So what I've been doing for the past couple months uh, with the assistance of Bruce Rogers, who's a colleague, uh, an applied mathematician at Arizona State, is sorting through these data, trying to analyze what they show us about the growth and decline of websites, and ultimately trying to model a lot of the behavior that we see. And as I'll be getting to, I think a lot of this behavior is quite unusual. Um, but uh, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. But before I, I get too deep into the modeling, before I talk too much about this data, I want to talk a little bit about why, why this matters. Um, as I talk about it in the book, an awful lot of our scholarship about the internet has been predicated um, to a greater or lesser degree on what I call the Robin Hood assumption. This assumption that what the internet is really doing is it's robbing from the audience rich and it's giving to the audience poor. There's all kinds of permutations of this argument. Talk about narrow casting or point casting. Talking about the fragmentation of the media environment that we hear from media elites, that we hear from, uh, from, from presidential candidates. Um, all fits into this mold. And in the academy, um, we've seen, and in, popu in the popular press, we've seen recently some more sophisticated, more subtle, um, frankly, more persuasive versions of this uh, recently uh, through folks like uh, Cass Sunstein, uh, 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 Yohai Bankler. In popular press, many of you are familiar with claims about the long tail, which is sort of a revised version of the, of the Robin Hood argument. Um, so I do a lot of things in the book. But one of the things that I do uh, is gather up all kinds of different sources of data and try to test whether this is actually what's going on. Try to figure out actually where people are going online and what sort of sources they're using. Um, and I, I use a lot of different data sources, but the, the, probably the most important, and the one I'm going to be referring to here today, uh, again, is Hitwise, uh, the Hitwise data. I want to take a moment just to talk a little bit more about um, what, uh, where this data comes from and a little bit about what its strengths and weaknesses are. So Hitwise, again, is a large internet tracking company, uh, originally out of Australia and now in uh, the UK, Singapore, the United States, um, a variety of other countries. And Hitwise provides anonymous uh, aggregate ISP level data. They install software on the servers of internet service providers uh, that monitor traffic, uh, clean it, aggregate it, and ship it back to Hitwise. Um, uh, and the, the general Hitwise sample is about 10 million US households out of about 110 million uh, nationwide. Um, about 7.5 million of these are in the ISPs. About 2.5 million of these are in opt-in mega panels, which they use largely to gather things like demographics. And I'm going to be talking a lot about traffic here today. And what I mean by traffic, unless I state it otherwise, is really visits. Um, and visits are defined. Uh, as a request for a page or series of pages from a website with no more than 30 minutes of inactivity. Uh, and I can talk more about this later uh, if there are questions. But I'm quite convinced that for a lot of things that social scientists are interested in, visits are the best metric to use. It's hard to use page views, for example, uh, without installing software on users' computer. Um, and if you install software on users' uh, computers, what you see is very different behavior, and particularly in a couple of areas. Uh, as you might expect, visits to adult content drop precipitously if you install um, software on their computer. Um, uh, measures of unique users or impressions are often not very consistent. Uh, time spent on site, again, very tough to get without installing software on computers. And I think that visitors is certainly a much better metric than uh, s things that you sometimes see, like monthly global audience reach, which really doesn't tell us a whole lot about how important a site is in uh, the public's media diet. 
So one of the things that we struggle with, I think, in understanding traffic is just the scale of the phenomenon that we're trying to get at here. Um, and this is actually one attempt of mine to get at the scale. This is actually a map of traffic on, uh, of US web traffic for January 2008. And this map is uh, to scale. Um, each of these sites uh, is, the area of each of these sites is proportional to the number of visits each of them receive. Uh, and what we see when we look at this data um, is that the top five sites in the center, which is uh, Google, uh, Yahoo Mail, uh, MySpace, um, uh, Yahoo, and uh, Windows Live Mail, altogether these five sites get about 21% of all US web visits. Taken together, the top 500 sites get about 51 and 52% of all traffic. So um, clearly, it's not just a Robin Hood story. So one of the things that we, of course, want to know, a lot of our claims about the internet are comparative claims. We want to know how this compares to the patterns that we're used to in traditional media. Uh, and I go through a number of different comparisons along these lines in the book. Um, but one, of the most one of the simplest comparisons is just to look at uh, some category of online traffic versus what we are used to in newspapers, the form of traditional media that has been most impacted by the advent of the internet. So this is actually the audience distribution curves for US newspaper circulation and for US news and media traffic. Now it may look like these lines are close together, but this is actually on a log scale, so they're really not. What we can see here um, is that the US news and media traffic forms an almost, uh, almost perfectly straight line on a log-log scale. Uh, it's a power law or Pareto di distribution, or pretty close, as many of you are familiar with. And US, US, US newspaper circulation uh, looks much more curvilinear. And again, what we've done here is we've, we've just ranked the outlet, we, we've, we've stacked up these outlets by rank, from biggest to smallest. And we, when we actually add up the numbers, what we find is that the top dozen US news and media outlets online have about 30% of the total online audience, whereas the top dozen uh, newspapers only have about 20% of US newspaper circulation. If we look at this middle part of the curve, right, which is all rank 12 down to about rank um, 500, collectively, this group of newspapers is the large majority of US print newspaper circulation, 73%, whereas it's only about half of news and media traffic. And below about 600, um, we only have about 6% of uh, newspaper circulation. You're pretty much out of newspapers by that point. Yet there are still thousands of online news outlets that, get a, not a, a, that collectively get a sizable audience, about 21% of the total traffic. So what's really going on is not just a Robin Hood story. What we see is that online audiences are getting both more and less concentrated. Right? So there's more eyeballs here and more eyeballs here, and it's really the sites in the middle that are being squeezed, that are showing relative decline in, uh, in their audience. All right, so that's the, that's the general context. Um, so I want to talk, spend the rest of my time talking about what I think has been missing from our understanding of web traffic. Um, and I think the biggest single thing that has miss been missing is that we've had almost no sense of system dynamics. We haven't understood at all um, the process by which sites gain and lose market share. So for example, we want to know um, how sites are likely to do over time. We want to know the odds that Google will still be the number one site a year from now. We are, uh, many of you, I, I, and certainly myself, want to be good social scientists. We want to quantify our uncertainty. And we also want to know not just how the big sites are going to do, but how the smaller sites are going to do. We want to know what are the odds that this uh, shiny new site at rank 100 will jump to rank 50 at the end of a year's time. What are the odds that it will go to rank 10? So partly our claims, are, 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 our hopes, are really about individual site performance. But we also really want to understand, again, how this audience distribution curve is likely to evolve over time. Is online concentration increasing, or is it decreasing? Are we becoming more or less fragmented over time? 
or, is, or, is, or, or are online audiences converging to some stable distribution? And even more important, as I think we're, we're going to see, do different sized outlets behave differently? Do small sites online behave differently than big sites? So I talked a little bit more about the Hitwise data. Let me, let me explain where this new Hitwise uh, data source. So what we're using here, um, and what I'll be using for the rest of the talk, is daily market share data. So the portion of the total visits that are accounted for um, by individual websites. This is three years worth of data um, from July of 2005 uh, through the end of June 2008. And this uh, data includes the top 300 sites, the daily market share for the top 300 sites in three categories. First of all, all the sites the Hitwise tracks, roughly 800,000 on the internet on a typical day. Um, all sites in Hitwise's news and media category. Um, which is which uh, the top 300 sites on a given day account for about 80% of, of that category's traffic. And then the top 300 sites in Hitwise's politics category, which is sort of a, a grab bag of everything from blogs to campaign websites um, to online forums uh, that deal with politics. Uh, I'm going to be talking mostly about uh, uh, traffic over the entire internet and traffic within this news and media category here today. So just to give you a broad sense of what this traffic looks like, this is graphed over these three years, uh, the daily market share of the top five sites. Um, we can see a lot of things in this uh, data. So you may see uh, that we have uh, MySpace, which has an incredible run up until the middle of the summer of 2007, uh, in which pace, in which, in, at which time uh, it apparently stops being quite as cool and starts losing market share, it drops down to a uh, third. We can also see the incredibly steady growth of Google during this time. Uh, Google just keeps growing and growing, just keeps eating up more and more market share. So how are we going to, so how should we think about this kind of data? How should we begin to analyze it? Well, I want to make a suggestion. Um, and it's going to first probably seem like a diversion, but I promise you it's not. I want to talk about stock prices. I want to talk about um, our intuitions about stock markets and how our markets, how stock markets work. So most of us know that stock prices are, continue, are a continuous process. Stock, market, mark, stock prices change on a daily, hourly, even by minute by minute basis. Um, any individual in a public market can buy or sell any stock. Um, we know that at any given point, uh, stock prices can go up or they can go down. Um, yet at the same time, as we're very familiar with at the moment, there are long-term trends for individual stocks and for the market as a whole. We talk about bull markets and bear markets. We know that, that stock markets have very strong size effects, that they're, they're, they tend to be quite top-heavy. A lot of the capital is invested just in the, in the, in the, in the largest stocks. And we know that large cap, mid cap, and penny stocks behave differently. The smaller a stock is, the more it tends to vary on a daily, monthly, weekly basis. This is why we don't recommend to our friends, for example, that they invest all of their life savings in penny stocks. Right? We know that some stocks move together or in opposite directions. We know that certain sectors of the market move together. We know that some stocks are negatively correlated. Oftentimes, when you see a big crash, uh, and we saw it a couple times during this, this fall, it was a big market crash, and the only stock that advanced was uh, Campbell's canned soup, right? Um, cl cl canned goods, a classic hedge, right? Um, so that we know that there are strong, that the, that the movements of stocks are correlated. We know that if we look at the FTSE 100, if we look at the S&P 500, we know that the structure of the market tends to be quite stable over time. If we look at the portion of the total market in the top 50 stocks, for example, the percentage of capital in those top 50 stocks tends to be pretty consistent over the long run. And we also know from the, from the econometrics and from the financial mathematics literature that price changes are log normally distributed. That is, if we take a whole bunch of stocks and take the log of their daily changes in price, and plot them over time. What you get at any point is a nice, normal bell curve right, that just expands the farther, away, the farther out we go in time. 
Um, this is a very important property that allows an awful lot of financial mathematics to work, and we're going to be um, relying on it um, here today. But take another look at this list. What I want to suggest to you is that every single item on this list is a property that we either know or expect, or at least should expect, to see in the movement of online audiences. We should expect to see in web traffic. We know that web traffic happens all the time. It's a continuous process. Uh, any individual um, can visit almost any site on the internet. We know that at any given point, a traffic share of a site can go up or down. We know that certain sites, as we've seen, show long-term trends. We know that the general movement of internet traffic, um, even though it's slowed in recent years, the general trend is for more and more visits over time. We know that the, uh, we know that the movements of certain, certain sites are correlate. Certain sites tend to get bigger or smaller together. Um, and we're going to be looking um, to see whether or not um, levels of concentration are stable over time and whether these price changes really are, um, or whether, these, whether these audience share changes really are log normally distributed. So let's look first at the level of concentration. Um, so one of the things, I've, I've done these, this analysis with a number of different measures of concentration. This, um, I have uh, used the Gini coefficient, uh, uh, the, probably the single most uh, po popular measure of concentration uh, in the social sciences. And if we look at concentration over every single day of this three-year period, what we see is that it seems relatively stable. We get a somewhat different picture if we look at um, over the entire internet, and it seems somewhat uh, more highly concentrated um, than we see within the politics category or the news and media category. But again, we don't see a clear trend over time. Uh, that the, and in fact, the series uh, seems to be more or less mean reverting. Um, so OK, so, this, so we really do see pretty stable levels of concentration uh, it, over these three years. So one of the other things that uh, we're curious about in this, uh, in this data is whether or not this really is, is how, how, how hard this structure is. Um, whether, because we would expect in the stock market that the more volatile sites would, that the, the, the lar in the stock market we would expect that the largest stocks would be the least volatile. Do we see the same kind of behavior here? Uh, and in fact, we certainly do. Um, so take a, take a, so this, this chart is actually uh, on the, on the y-axis. We have the days where the site at rank X changes. And on the x-axis, we just look at all of these different, uh, all of these different ranks. So at the start, we'll see that if uh, a site begins the day at rank 1, it has about a 10% chance of being at rank 1 the following day. The top dozen sites over the internet in this HitWise data trade places only about 10 to 20 percent of the time. And they tend to trade places only with each other. But notice the difference between the, the uh, site that's ranked 12, which is only changing less than 10 percent of the time, and the site that's ranked 15, which is changing almost 80 percent of the time. The site at that rank changes a, a, about 80 percent of the time on a typical day. So we see um, these strong discontinuities in the level of volatility. We see similar sort of kinds of patterns um, when we look just at subsections of the web. So here we've put up news and media sites. Right? So the volatility, again, seems to be pretty strongly associated with rank. Um, the top news site uh, is going to, uh, it only changes about 12% uh, of the time. Um, and yet, as we go further and further up the rankings, we see less and less stability to the point where if you're the news site at, uh, at, uh, at rank 300, you're changing pretty much every day. One of the things that we're also concerned with when we have this sort of list of top 300 sites is leakage. Uh, it's in, and again, this is, a, this is something you see in financial indices, for example. So the question is, we know that on, every, on, a, on a, any given day, um, sites are going to change in terms of the level of traffic they receive. They could go up. They could go down. And if they go down, it's possible that they could go down far enough that they drop off our index. And what we see, again, is a quite regular uh, structure of volatility. Um, 
There's very little leakage uh, up till you get about to rank 150. No, uh, sites that start off a day ranked 150 almost never leave the index. And yet it in increases um, till by the time you get to about rank 300, the site that's at rank 300, more than 50% of the time will disappear from the index the next day. And new sites will come on. Um, about 93% of the sites that appear on the index um, uh, having not been on it the day before um, are sites that we've seen before. So it's a bunch of sites that are just right near this 300 threshold that just are going back and forth just on the volatility of randomness on any given day. So here's where I think it gets really interesting. So please um, bear with me. This slide shows the daily variance in relative market share, so the portion of traffic that they gain or lose, depending on their size, um, aligned by the log of the rank. And what we see here is that sites that are at the very top of this hierarchy, at the very top of this period, are very, uh, are very stable. Um, and as, they, as we go further and further down in the rankings, we see that um, the amount that they jump from one day to the next, um, given their starting rank, gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So if we look at uh, right here at, uh, at sites that start the day at rank 150, right, there are enormously more they have enormously more variance uh, in terms of how much they're going to be jumping around from one day to the next than sites that start at rank 10. So this is the behavior of individual sites. And this is the behavior of individual sites based on where they start on, on a given day. But here's the paradox in my, uh, in, my, uh, in my title. This is similar data, but here we're not looking at the behavior of sites. Here we're looking at the values at every rank. So whereas before we wanted to know what happened to the site that started the day at rank 100, here we just want to know whatever the value it is of rank 100 at any, at, at any given day. So what we can see here, um, first of all, is that the value of the, the, that the average change for the value of every rank is almost zero. You can see there's a tiny little blip at the start and at around 50. But generally, this, this line is almost ruler flat. So the structure of this, uh, of this uh, uh, the structure of the online system is incredibly stable. And we can see, if we look at, the, at this curve, that there are three different areas. Uh, and, the, and if you actually do the math, you find three different phenomena going on. And these lines on the outside um, are, the, uh, are, are the, uh, the solid line is one standard deviation. Um, calculated, just just doing the the, the, uh, uh, the st just uh, just calculating it, um, and the dotted line is the inner 68 percent. So it's basically what what we see here um, is that uh, there are uh, straw that there's that the tails are a little bit uh, a little bit heavy. Um, the top rank site uh, and every day is yellow, right? And if it changes with the purple site, um, the purple site becomes yellow again. Um, but notice the bandwidth here. Notice how consistent the bandwidth is uh, over, this, over this period of time. So what we've done here is we've, we've, we've modeled, tried to model, tried to replicate as much of this movement as we can just using these simple Brownian motion models, just day after day after day of, draw, of draws from our normal curve. And what we get when we do this is something that looks like this. Right? Now, this data is smooth in a slightly different way, which is part of why it looks, um, uh, why it doesn't have the spikiness of the previous graph. Um, but generally speaking, an awful lot of the movement uh, that we see in traffic is captured uh, using, these, uh, using these techniques. Um, 
And particularly, the bandwidth uh, is pretty well captured just by using these simple uh, Brownian motion models. So what are the implications of this? Part of what we're trying to do, is it, to do here is to show what the implications of these daily growth rates are over the long term. So what we did, um, Bruce and I, um, is we actually went out and we did 10,000 simulations of 365 days worth of data. And we tried to figure out where sites ended up, given where they had started. And so what we find when we do this for the news and media site data, for example, um, is that if a site starts out at rank one, it has about a 60% chance over the course of a year of still being at rank one. Um, and if it does drop below rank one, right, it doesn't generally go far. If a site starts out the year at rank five, according to our model, it's got about a 40% chance of being at rank five a year later. Um, and, if it, and it's a lot easier for a site that starts out at rank five to go down rather than up. Um, and generally speaking, uh, the further we go down in the rankings, the more these curves spread out, the bigger the estimated probability distribution gets. And we can find we have similar kinds of results if we look at data over the entire web. Remember that discontinuity in our volatility graph? That's replicated right here uh, in site 10. Site 10, uh, over the entire internet, according to our model, um, has a big gulf between it and the entire rest of the web. It has to lose an awful lot proportionally of traffic um, in order to get there. And it's very rare in our simulations for it to do that. So about 90% of the time, if you start off the year at rank 10, that's where you're going to be uh, a year later. Similarly, the top site is very unlikely to lose its position. Um, and it's also very tough for sites that start out far down in the rankings to, uh, to break into the top 10. Um, sites that start off at, at rank 20, again, they have a much easier time going down than they do going up. And similarly, by the time you get down to rank 50, you can end up anywhere below this top 10 sites over the course of a year. Um, so how does this simulation actually map to real data? Um, so one way we can test this is we have three years' worth of data. So for every rank, what we did is we said, OK, uh, we're going to look at the difference between day one and day 365 for rank one. And then we're going to look at the, day, the difference between day 366 and, uh, and the value a year on. And so we do this three times for every rank. And that's what's plotted in those blue dots. Um, for every single rank. And what we see when we actually uh, do this is that the model works strikingly well for sites that are ranked 50 or above. Um, about 75% of the sites um, uh, actually are captured within two standard deviations. Uh, obviously, we'd like 95%. Right? But for a model that has almost nothing in it, that's, that's actually pretty remarkable. So there's an awful lot of the movement of these top sites that we're capturing just by varying how much they move on a daily basis by their ranking. Um, below 50, what we see is that our model is slightly biased upwards and that the variance is compressed a little bit. Um, this is actually the first run. Um, and um, the, this is a result of not adequately taking into account the fact that uh, sites that leak off the index um, are, are biasing our results a little bit. Um, because we know that they drop down, but we don't really know how far they drop down. Um, the, mo the, the latest models that I was working on just as I ran out the door uh, correct for this, and they actually get about 85% of the data uh, below 50 uh, in this two standard deviations. All right. So what does all of this mean? All right. um, I've showed you some pretty pictures. Um, I know that many of you don't really care that much about econometric models of the stock market. Um, but the reason why I've gone through this, partly, of course, as I think it's important to get the numbers right, to get the data right, but also because I think that understanding these phenomena has enormous impacts for our understanding of the web.
So let me show you a couple. Uh, let me talk about these more generally, and let me give you a couple of specific examples where I think that this matters a great deal. I think the first thing that we can conclude from going through this exercise is that an awful lot of the system level behavior can be explained as a function of these stochastic daily changes. We've known for a long time that traffic on the internet was roughly power law distributed. What we have not had is any credible uh, explanation for why that is. Right? Um, and I think that what we do, what we're doing here is we're, put, we're at least kicking the can down the road to force us to look at micro level, possible li micro level explanations um, that can replicate what we see in the overall structure of the web. And really, I think um, it's important to understand this paradox. That for, from the perspective of any individual site, there is high and extremely heteroscedastic variance. That the smaller you are, um, in the, 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 the smaller your levels of traffic, the more that traffic is going to fluctuate on a daily, monthly, yearly basis. Um, whereas the big sites tend to be quite stable over time. And I think this helps us reconcile the fact that we, uh, we see that Google remains the top site uh, on the internet, even though we know that so many other areas of the, uh, of the web are in constant flux. But the fact that their web is in constant flux shouldn't distract us for the fact that the, from the fact that the audience distribution is remarkably stable. And part of what these models are meant to do is they're, they're meant to be a first step. They're meant to be a framework for, previous, for a future analysis. Um, anything that you can put, any, any, linear any linear combination of variables, anything you can put in a regression analysis, we can put in these models. And we have a lot of things that I'll be talking about in a second that might help us predict stability over time. Because an awful lot of what we want to know about the web for example, regulators want to know how likely it is that Google is going to lose its position um, uh, in, a, in order to develop, to craft appropriate policies. So kids, but let's, let's think a little bit more about um, Google. So Google has about 70% of a US search market. Uh, is as simil similarly dominant in other Western uh, European countries. When you actually look at the data, what you find is that Google seems to be both the driver and the beneficiary of this churn. Um, the greater the portion of traffic that a site gets from Google, even controlling for size, the more volatility we see in their numbers over time. Um, what this means is that, is that sites that get a greater portion of traffic from Google are going to vary an awful lot more. Uh, and that probably has important implications for policy as well. Um, I think this, this, uh, these, this behavior also helps us explain part of why Google has been so dominant in the online ad space. Um, because one thing about Google Ads is they scale as you're growing and as you're declining. Um, whereas with traditional media outlets, it's very hard to, uh, to develop an advertising base. And that generally takes a great deal of time. And that's time that you're likely not going to have. Uh, in an online audience. Um, I also think that there are profound implications here for the fate of local media, and particularly for newspapers. We've seen an awful lot of ink spilled on both sides of the Atlantic, worrying about the fate of uh, local media, local newspapers. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about hopes that the web could save newspapers, could save these uh, flagging institutions. Um, and some of the problems with uh, the web as a savior for newspapers are well known. The fact that uh, it needs, you need about 30 online readers uh, to replace a single lost print subscriber. Um, and the fact that newspapers in general have lost an awful lot of their display advertising, their classified advertising. Um, for a lot of newspapers, um, Craigslist uh, is a very, very bad thing. Because roughly, for a typical mid-sized US paper, about 40% of their revenue came from, uh, from classified advertising. But what you see in these numbers, when you actually drill down, is that in both the US and, and the UK, national papers have gained online at the expense of local and regional papers. And partly what's going on here is the, effect, is the fact that online shelf space is limited. 
because the structure of online audience is so stable, what you really have is big media outlets playing musical chairs. And how much audience they get depends on which chair they happen to be sitting in. Um, and the fact that these, this shelf space is so limited uh, means that traditional staffing levels are going to be impossible to maintain unless media, these media institutions manage to break into the upper echelons of the web. That's going to be very hard for them to do. But the even bigger problem um, from the perspective of newspapers is online volatility. Newspapers are used to a stable subscription base. And often, uh, the smaller a newspaper was, the more stable its subscription base was. The internet reverses these traditional patterns. The smaller an, an online outlet is, the more, in general, it's going to vary on a, a, over time. Newspapers know how to go small. Right? That may be tough for them. That may be painful. What they don't know how to do is how to survive in an environment where their revenue could change on a yearly basis anywhere from 50% growth to 50% decline. Right? That's very difficult to how, how do you manage, how do you staff an organization facing that level of volatility uh, in revenue. So with that, I will uh, conclude. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matthew. I think that was a really, really exciting um, paper. Um, a, a, a Spanish journalist uh, noted recently that we all have to be economists now, that we all have to retrain as economists just to read the news um, in the current financial climate. Um, and uh, I think Matthew has shown very well that now we have to be economists to um, understand the internet um, and the internet behavior as well. Um, so we can all be killing two birds with one stone. Um, I think actually that any of us who are involved in sort of researching and trying to understand life on the internet um, can see a lot of value in drawing parallels with, um, uh, with, with, with stock markets and internet traffic. Um, just because of the kind of capacity in different sections in, in different ways, the internet to inject competition where there wasn't competition before. I mean, I mostly look at, look at government, governmental organizations, political organizations, and the extent to which <clears throat> these organizations have had to become used to the idea that it's not automatic that people are going to go to government, for example, to find something out, um, to get information, to get advice, anything like that. Government organizations are very used to the idea that people sort of bring, look at the phone number up in the dictionary and come along. And the idea that they can get information from whole ranges of, of different sources and do um, is, is, is a challenging idea for governmental organisations. It's also obviously a fantastically challenging um, notion for um, newspapers, as you pointed out. I mean, the, the fact that they are no longer institutionalised um, in, in the sense that you know you buy this paper because you know, it looks smart or this paper because um, uh, um, you, you've always bought it or your parents bought it. Um, that idea is eroded, and also perhaps the way that people kind of spend their public attention this, this, in this market for public attention, the way people spend it has also changed in much sort of smaller chunks. I mean, if you buy a newspaper, then you're spending a big chunk of your attention all at once. You're, you're appearing on, on the grass for circulation figures. Um, it's all gone at once, whereas in fact, you now there are so many diverse ways for people to spend um, their attention in much smaller bits. Um, you know, maybe looking at the same newspaper that they always look at online, but then sort of skating off into the New York Times, perhaps to kind of look at what the headlines are or, or any other um, area of interest. So I can see a lot of value in that, and I thought it was very interesting, your conclusion, we kind of expect all that to lead um, to volatility, and yet um, you, were, you were finding um, stability. Um, or at least in, 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 in some parts of the spectrum. Um, another thing that I, I thought was really good about, uh, about this is, is um, the fact that uh, Matthew's got user data and he's not afraid to use it. I mean, I think we all, <laughs> we all, we all tend to think, or, or at least I always thought before I, before I uh, started 
looking at um, and specializing um, in, in, in life on the internet that this was such a fantastic opportunity to vast amounts of transactional data about the way people behave of a kind we've never had before. Um, and it is, of course, it does generate huge amounts of transactional data. And um, Google have got huge amounts of transactional data and quite a lot of other companies have as well. But we, as academic researchers, quite often haven't got any more data than we had before. And in some ways, um, in some ways, perhaps we've even got less data than we had before. I mean, if I think particularly of overtime data, we've got overtime data here. That's another thing that we, we, we don't tend to have because we tend to, by the time we thought that it would be a good idea to have a look at that five years ago, it's too late to look at that five years ago. Whereas uh, with newspaper, uh, with the, well, once newspaper data became electronic, it actually was possible to look in, in, in quite detailed ways and track um, media attention over time, for example. Um, here, why data isn't perfect, um, and I'm sure Matthew would be very um, would, would be very good at explaining why why it isn't perfect. But the point is, um, we're, we're looking for, for general trends and patterns and, 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 and models here, and it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, and, it's data, and um, we, we, we should be using it. So I think Matthew's really um, to be congratulated for that. I suppose I just kind of think about two key questions. I mean, one, how, you, you, you said we would be looking to predict this market. It's an interesting to say. Social scientists would never say that. Certainly political scientists would never ever say anything like that. Um, but, um, can we really predict that this this market any better than we can predict stock markets? I mean, um, your, your assertion that we could, could predict the stock market, perhaps particularly at this particular moment in time, um, uh, um, and, and, and a little unclear. Um, but I mean, I suppose it is a really interesting question: is you know, if there was to be a big crash, can we visualise a big crash? Could there be a big crash around the corner? Um, just as a, 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 a world stock market. I mean, um, and what would that look like? You know, what would survive and and and, and what wouldn't? Um, and I suppose the other point, also in terms of, of prediction, um, what, what about new players? I mean, that's something that we tend to think about the internet. That these massive new players come flooding in um, from nothing to billions of users, um, and I wasn't quite seeing that reflected in, 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 in the patterns here, and I thought it would be interesting to think about that. I mean, I, I suppose in a way, um, I suppose it, it must be difficult for the Hitwise data to, 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 to capture this, to talk about market share, but you know, sometimes it's difficult to know what mar market new players were in. I mean, YouTube, for example, Flickr, um, Second Life, you know, these, these sites which, which show us that um, in fact, people had much more time than we thought they had. I mean, they had time to <laughs> go on Second Life, just had huge quantities of time, you know, on gaming sites, on Facebook, huge sort of tranches of people's days that we didn't know for a um, which in a way is, it, you know, might expect us to make it far, far less predictable. And I didn't, I didn't see, for example, YouTube appearing. I'm sure it's in your data, and, and, and you know what, it, what, what, what it's doing, but. Um, I suppose that would be another question we have. Where do the new players come from and what can we predict um, about them because they seem everything is unpredictable. Thank you.